Okay, I'm going to tell you about um, an experience that I've had um, called the Lapworth Walk. The Lapworth Walk. Okay, now, um, what's the Lapworth Walk? The Lapworth Walk is basically a walk that I used to do, and that my brother and I used to do, and the walk was from the train station to my parents' house. It's about three miles, about four kilometres, something like that. And the reason that we had to do this walk was because we lived in the countryside. The only way that we could get into Birmingham, into the nearest city, to go nightclubbing or to go uh, drinking with our friends would be to catch a train from Lapworth Station, which was four kilometres away from the house, and then take the train to Birmingham. And then at night we would come back to the station and we would have to walk from the station to uh, our parents' place four kilometres through country roads in the middle of the countryside, in the middle of nowhere, to get back to the house. Okay, now you might think, that sounds lovely, walking through the countryside at night. In fact, it was one of the scariest walks that I've ever had to do, and I used to do it quite a lot, and it would scare me almost every time, particularly the first few times I did it. So, just to give you some context, I grew up in London, basically, for the first 10 years of my life. I was a city boy, uh, I grew up in 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 West London, and I, you know, I was used to living in in a very populated place. Um, then, when I was nine or ten, uh, my dad got a job in the Midlands, and we moved. We moved to a big house in the countryside, which was quite different. Living out there on the edge of the countryside, very different experience to living in the city, surrounded by people. Now, we were surrounded by fields, trees, nature just nothing, just the sort of mystery of the countryside. The town where we lived was, well, it wasn't really a town, it was a tiny village on a road. The only things there were a pub and a little football pitch and a few houses. And just to the back of this this little village was just open countryside, basically. In the middle of that open countryside, four uh, kilometres away, was the nearest train station, and this is the train line that went from London to Birmingham, Birmingham being the second biggest city in the UK, I think, and the nearest city to where my parents lived. So we grew up in this te- in this very isolated house in the middle of the countryside. There were no buses, no taxis out there. Um, we didn't drive, my brother and I. So the only way that we could access civilization, pubs, nightclubs bars and our friends was to go via this station in the middle of nowhere so it was fine going there in the first place mum or dad would give us a lift in the car and it would often be very nice drive through the countryside we'd go out into town meet our friends drink in the pub have a very good time and then i you know either me alone or him alone or the two of us Quite often it was me alone because my brother was at university and so I used to go out into Birmingham on my own. So I would be with my friends in the pub having a good time. We would all go to the station to get the last train home, which was typically at about 12.30. So we'd be on the train and my friends would all get off before me because they all lived at you know stops in, in Solihull and other places. So they would get off the train before me and then I would be left on the train on my own. So first of all, being in Birmingham itself can be quite dangerous because it's, it used to be quite a rough place. You'd often see people fighting in pubs, crime, that kind of thing. So just being out in the city could be quite dangerous. So you have to be careful in the city. But then... By one o'clock in the morning, I would find myself on a train alone, heading into the darkness, into the countryside. We would, the train would arrive at Lapworth Station, and usually I would be the only person to get off because no one else lived in that part of the countryside. So I'd get off the train, the train would leave, and then suddenly I'm alone in this station in the middle of the countryside. Okay, and I'd have to walk through the darkness. So I'm going to talk you through the walk to give you an idea of why it's scary. Now, if you're sort of a macho man or a a bloke who thinks he's pretty tough, yeah, you're probably listening to this and going, come on, Luke, don't be a pussy, mate. Come on. It doesn't sound that bad. Just a nice walk in the countryside. Yeah, fine. It doesn't sound that bad. But for some reason at the time, it's really scary. It is. You're on your own. 
it's just you and the darkness. You've got to walk off into the middle of nowhere. For some reason, that's frightening because it goes against your basic instinct, doesn't it? Your instinct is just sort of stay where there's, where there's light, stay where you can see things. And where it's completely pitch black, it's probably best not to go there because you don't know what's in there. Especially when you're 17 years, years old, you've got an active imagination, it can be quite scary. So the first part of the walk would be through this little village near the station, and that was normally fine. You're kind of walking past houses, everyone's in bed, they're all asleep, it's normally okay. You just hope that you're not going to see anyone, because in the countryside, if you see other people, it's, it's quite rare, so it's a bit awkward. So you'd walk through the town... And then you'd get to the other end of the town and the street lights would just stop. So no more street lights. And you'd start walking down a road into the countryside and it's just black at the end of the road. You walk away from the light into the darkness. Okay. And you realize, you know that you've got about 30 minutes of walking ahead of you just through, through the darkness. So as I've said before, it goes against your basic instincts. You don't want to walk into pitch darkness. But uh, I had to do it. So I would walk through and the first part would be uh, a bridge, a humpback bridge. So that this is a very steep bridge going over a canal. And um, so I'd have to walk up the bridge and I'd always, always, always be scared that there was something under the bridge because you could hear the sound of the water splashing beneath the bridge. And you, you can sort of see some things around you in the moonlight but then there would be large patches of darkness. And you know that there's just a kind of open, dark space. Your mind plays tricks on you. You think there's something under the bridge, isn't there? And typically I'd be walking extremely quickly. You walk through these open areas where you can see fields, open fields around you. And at night, you can sort of see in the half light Often it's not completely pitch black when there are no trees above you. So you have a kind of half light. And it's very tempting to look out into the fields around you. But because it's half light, because you can't see things clearly, you can see these open fields, hedgerows, shadows, big old oak trees along the line of the road. And you start imagining things. You can't help it. It's very difficult not to it's very difficult to stop yourself imagining that you're seeing things. And in fact, when you see things out of the corner of your eye, it could be a shadow, maybe just a hedge. But when you see it from the corner of your eye, you you start to imagine it's like uh, the shape of a person, or maybe you just saw something moving past your vision. Um, It's very unnerving. Um, So you have to walk through this area where there's open fields, you feel exposed, Um, I would often be walking very, very fast. And sometimes the only thing I could see on the ground in front of me was the white lines on the road. Also, I'd be very sort of uh, nervous about people behind me. I used to get paranoid that people would be following me. Like maybe some madman from the village saw me walking up the road on my own and decided that he'd come and follow me or something. So I'd always be like looking over my shoulder, paranoid that someone would be behind me um now the the other uh, scary thing about this was that um there was very close to the road um uh, an old house uh, an old uh manor house now all over the country in england we have these old country houses these big stately homes um often just stuck in the middle of the countryside and they would have been owned by sort of local powerful people landowners they would have owned all the countryside around the house and so they're old old houses often sort of dating back 600 years or something like that Um, and just nearby where I had to walk through the countryside in the middle of the night there was one of these houses and I knew it was there it was just off the road to the right at the end of a, a driveway down a hill and there it was this big old house very sort of uh, dark it, the outside of it had become kind of dirty over time so it was kind of dark surrounded by uh, a pool of water just alone in the middle of this pool of water no one lived in it either just an empty house and um, it was kind of a famous place in that area it was sort of the local old house 
that people could visit. You could actually go and take visits there during the day. And there were lots of stories all about this house. In fact, it's, it's famous for being one of Britain's haunted houses. Okay. Um, now, normally I don't believe in the idea of a haunted house. But when you're walking through the countryside in the middle of the night in darkness, um, scared that someone is following you, what you don't need is the knowledge that you're walking right past one of Britain's most haunted houses, okay? I know that rationally you think, well, it's, you know, it's, uh, ghosts don't exist. But in those conditions, you don't need much more to make you really scared. So I would be walking past knowing full well that this house was there. And the point at which you're closest to the house is where the road goes up a hill. And on that hill, the road is completely covered with trees. So you start walking up the hill... And all the light from the moon is blocked out. It's total darkness. Basically, you're walking up through a tunnel of complete darkness. And that's really scary because you don't really know what you're walking towards. You can hear sounds in the bushes next to you, rustling sounds, probably animals in the bushes. You just keep walking. You don't want to look behind you because if you look behind you, you see how dark it is behind you too. I mean, it's one thing walking into total darkness, but when you turn around and you realise that there's total darkness behind you as well, you're completely surrounded, engulfed by blackness. Um, it's a very scary experience. I mean, if you have ever walked through a house empty in the middle of the night in darkness, maybe someone else's house and you feel a bit scared. Well, imagine that, but not even in a house. You're outside in the countryside. And just over the hill, there is this famously haunted house. Now, the stories of this house are quite well known in the area. Uh, one of the stories is that uh, a murder was committed in the house. And the, the guy who owned the house, whose name was Coombe, I believe, um, Mr Coombe, once came home from uh, some trip away. He came home to see that the local priest was, um, like, kissing his wife under the fireplace. So he came in to see this, and he immediately went over to the priest and murdered him. He hit him over the head with a, with a, a metal poker from the fireplace. Hit him over the head, uh, murdering him. So... First of all, there's the story of this gruesome murder which took place in the house. But apparently, um, the wound from the priest's head bled onto the wood of the floor in front of the uh, the fireplace and um, left a, a bloodstain. And the bloodstain is still there. In fact, they can't remove the bloodstain. Uh, it's it's um, an indelible bloodstain. Now... <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I had a ghost book. I had a book all about ghosts. It, it explained uh, the origins of many of the legends of ghost stories. It explained how um, people explain the existence of ghosts, saying that, for example, if people die in tragic circumstances, sometimes the ghost will remain there. If something terrible happened during a person's life, sometimes their spirit will be prevented from moving into the afterlife or whatever, and they'll, have, they'll end up um, staying in that spot kind of repeating the same actions over and over again other things were things like the idea of a bloodstain that couldn't be removed and i remember that being in the book well in this house there was a bloodstain on the fireplace that couldn't be removed and i'd actually visited the house um sort of years before when we first moved into the area we had a guided tour of the house we saw the bloodstain on the floor it's there there is a bloodstain like a black mark on the ground uh still there after all these years um and the owner uh mr coombe apparently was a pretty bad guy uh, a violent man and um as a punishment for this murder he and and a number of other things he was eventually buried uh in the grounds of the house standing up now that apparently is a punishment if you're buried standing up you know normally you're put into a coffin lying down on your back and you're lowered into the ground well mr coombe was buried standing up so vertical and apparently at the time that was considered to be a great punishment because you can't rest 
if you're buried in the ground vertically with your feet down and your head up, you can't rest properly. And so this is kind of the origin of a number of stories. And there have been accounts by a number of people staying at the house that they hear the sound of someone moving around the corridors at night. They can hear the footsteps, they can hear the sounds of doors opening and closing. And many people say that it's Mr. Coombe still moving around the house because he can't rest in peace because of the way he's been buried. Add that to the blood stain on the flo- on the uh, fireplace and add that to the fact that this is a very mysterious house, not just because people say it's haunted, not just because the owner is buried vertically in the grounds of the house, not just because there's a blood stain, an indelible blood stain on the floor, but also because there are lots of secret rooms and secret passageways in this old house. Now, the the, the house dates back to Tudor times, that's sort of like the um, uh, 16th century and the time of the Reformation. This is when there were many changes in in England, including the, a move away from the Catholic Church towards the Church of England. Okay, and that caused a very bitter, very violent divide between the Protestant Church or the Church of England and the Catholic Church. and And Catholics were outlawed in England. If you were a Catholic priest or if you were a Catholic sympathizer, uh, you would have been uh, searched, caught and punished very severely. Now, um, the people who lived in Bannersley Clinton, this house, apparently at the time were Catholic sympathisers. That's the word, Catholic sympathisers. And they they protected Catholic priests who were escaping from Protestants who would come searching for Catholics in order to, to kill them, to have them killed. Uh, the punishments for protecting Catholics could have been uh, to be hung drawn and quartered the catholics could have been burned alive um, that kind of thing and so the house was designed with lots of secret rooms and hiding places for example there would there was there's a passageway behind the stairs which leads to a hole which goes directly down into the sewer where there is a space for catholics to hide other little concealed rooms and things like that and apparently these rooms would have been used to hide catholics so when Uh, People came to search the house. They couldn't find them. The Catholics could survive and so on, right? But because these rooms were so difficult to find and difficult to access, sometimes uh, the Catholic priests hiding in them would become trapped inside and they would die in there. And uh, apparently, um, sort of a couple of hundred years ago, one of these rooms was discovered. It was excavated and it was discovered to be full of uh, skeletons, right? So not only do we have a ghost haunting the house, do we have the owner buried standing up, not only do we have an indelible blood stain, we also have a secret room full of skeletons, okay? Now, these are all real things. So imagine me walking up through the darkness, knowing that this house is just over the hill, Honestly, it was horrible, absolutely horrible. And one particular occasion, I would be walking up the road um, and uh, I looked back over my shoulder and I was very surprised and terrified to see a torch at the bottom of the road, a torch, a light. And I could see the light waving from left to right. Um, now, bear in mind, it was probably about one thirty in the morning um, when I saw this. And I thought, now, who who would be walking now? Obviously, I've just come from the station, but there was no one else on the train. Who is going to be walking up this road with a torch right now? And, and obviously, your mind starts to play tricks on you. You think, OK, maybe it's a person walking their dog, but why would they be walking their dog at one thirty in the morning? And then you start thinking, well, maybe this is Coombe. You know, I've heard so many stories of this ghost who walks around on his land because he can't rest. Anyway, that was enough for me. I ran the rest of the way home. Seriously, I ran all the way home. And I made it because of adrenaline that kept me going. There was another thing on this walk, this sort of uh, frightening, horrible walk. And that was that uh, one of the houses on the way, uh, one of the big old houses in the middle of the countryside, had a huge dog. The dog was a Great Dane. That's the type of dog. That was the breed of dog. It was a Great Dane. Great Danes are the biggest dogs in the world. 
UK. And this one was huge. And it was always very frightening when I had to walk past this house because I knew that there was a Great Dane. And often the Great Dane would be in the garden. Now, the the garden was very big, surrounded by a, a high fence. And if I walked past this house and the Great Dane was out, it would come running over to this to the fence. And the fence never seemed to be high enough. And um, now uh, I'm kind of OK with dogs usually, but this is like a monster. This looks like a horse. OK, this dog, a Great Dane, it looks like a small horse. And often what would happen is you'd be walking along next to the house um, along the road and you'd think, OK, the Great Dane's not there because it hasn't come yet. And then you would look into the garden and there was there was like a small forest lots and lots of trees at the back of the garden and you look into the garden you would see the thing before you hear it you'd see this shape moving between the trees and you think oh my god is that like a it looks like a ghost horse coming through the trees and then you hear it and it starts barking like that honestly it's a uh a spine-chilling sound, the sound of this huge beast coming running through the trees in the moonlight towards you. Truly terrifying, and, you know, you have to just keep walking, even though this monster is just there on the other side of the fence. So there you go. That's pretty much it. Those are my stories. 